How's it going, man? Good, man. How's it going? Doing really well. Hey, we got a full house for you. I'm Chad, Keith, Todd, and Dale. What up? What's right. up? Uh, There'll be a test later, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, appreciate you doing this. Sure, dude. Thanks for having me on. Hey, uh, before we get started, you care to do like a station ID for us? Hey, this, hey, this is Art from Everclear, and you're listening to the Midwest Mixtape Podcast. Midwest Mixtape Podcast. Okay, ready? Yep. Hey, everybody. This is Art from the band Everclear, and you're listening to the Midwest Mixtape Podcast. Impressive. Most people yep. don't get it first try. Yep, one out of one. <laughs> Probably not your first time they're, doing it. They're a bunch of peasants. That's yeah. <laughs> Not much. What's going on, Art? Well, nothing, man. Just, you know, in the back of the bus, just waking up, getting doing some interviews, getting ready for the show. The night here in beautiful Colony, Texas, which is a suburb of Dallas. Oh, Another sweet. Another sold-out show tonight. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. So seven sellouts out of the first ten <laughs> shows or eight, so something like that. Eight sellouts. So, yeah, man, this show is rocking. That's really awesome. Nice. Here, we'll get started here, okay? Thank you. Hi, and welcome to the Midwest Mixtape Podcast, live from the barn studio. You got the Mox, Keith, Todd, and Dale here. Full house for this man right here. Online, we are joined with Art from Everclear. Art, how are you, man? I'm doing well, brother. How are you guys doing? Doing really good. We're excited. Saturday, October 19th, Jefferson City, Missouri, CRMU Healthcare Amphitheater. Everclear, Marcy Playground, and Jimmy's Chicken Shack. A little bit of a 90s nostalgia there. Love it, though. Uh, more, more than a little bit, man. We're, we're, we're getting old school. Yeah, it's going to be old school 90s alternative night for sure. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. We're big fans here, and we appreciate you joining us today. But, you know, you're 10, 10, or, 10 or 11 dates into the sh- into the tour right now, and here it's going really well. Oh, man, it's killing it, man. It's like... I, I, I'm looking at the numbers, so tonight's going to uh, just just went clean. I just got a text that it sold out. Well, at eight sellouts in the first ten shows, pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, and we actually recently just spoke to Jimmy from Jimmy's Chicken Shack and, and asked him how this, to, uh, how this tour got put together, and he said that you called him personally and said, hey, you want to be a part of this? And he was like, heck yeah. <laughs> I did. I hadn't talked to Jimmy in years. We... We've been friends outside of even, you know, playing together back in the days with our bands, but uh, always been mutual fans, and we wrote a couple songs together back in the day, and uh, when uh, I knew we had Marcy Playground, and John, John Marsnick's a good friend of mine, uh, you know, I called Jimmy and just said, hey, would you guys be interested in doing it? And he said, yeah, so I, I had my agent reach out to their agent, and Put it together, man. It's just a great bill. Everclear is celebrating over three decades of music. How does it feel to st- still be out there performing, still having sold-out shows in amphitheaters? How does that feel? What kind of feeling comes with that? Um, Kind of unbelievable, right? I mean, when you're younger, you're never thinking you're going to be doing this in your 60s. But, you know, life does what it does. And I'm just grateful. I'm grateful that... Uh, the 90s revival happened. We were doing well before, but now it's just kind of off the charts. And the, the most interesting thing about it is, guys, when I look out into the crowd now, it's not just the old school fans. There's some young kids, you know, 17, 18, all the way up to like 30. A lot of these kids weren't even born when these songs were on the radio. How does that make you guys feel? You know, uh, it's like, and I do, and they know every word to every song, not just not just the hits. They go deep into it, and so seeing that and feeling that, and seeing the old school people just you know having a bit of nostalgia and just connecting. I I, I love the I love the fact that you know it, it's touching on all bases, and we're still out there working, man. And I get to really what it comes down to. I'm 62 years old, and I get to play guitar for a living and sing. How cool is that? Pretty cool. Pretty, awesome. pretty damn cool. Yes. Now, uh, yeah. Art... You know, playing playing for thirty years is absolutely impressive, and I'm making a living out of it. Um, but at what point in your life 
did you like, hey, you know, did you know that, hey, man, like I'm going to do music forever? And then at what point in your career did you kind of realize like, hey, I get to do music forever? Well, that's a good, that's a good two-headed question. I appreciate that. <laughs> to be honest with you, the first part of it, when I was four years old, 1966, I, uh, my mom had put me to bed, but uh, I hadn't fallen asleep yet. And I heard this sound on the TV, and I went out and hid behind the couch, like I do a lot of times, and watch. And it was the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Not the first time, but the third time, the last time <laughs> they played. And it just connected with something in me. I still remember that feeling. And I just ran to the TV and just started dancing around in my underwear. You know? <laughs> and uh, my siblings, my brothers and sisters, and, and my mom and dad were laughing. And to be honest with you, it, I, I, from that point on, I didn't think about being president, didn't think about being a policeman or a fireman. Other kids would say that, I'd be like, I want to play rock and roll. Mm -hmm. I never said rock star. I want to play rock and roll for a living. And that was my dream growing up, was to have a house. Have a, mm -hmm. I grew up poor, so in a, in, a, in a housing project. So to me, two or three levels up was the white picket fence, middle, middle class life, family. You know, that whole thing. That's And that's all I've ever aspired to. And though we've been bigger and smaller at different times, uh, you know, uh, and and had more money and less money at different times in, in my career, uh, I'm in a place right now where I make really good money. All my guys make money. Um, I have a nice house. Not huge house. I've had bigger houses. <laughs> it's a nice house mm -hmm. in a nice area. And uh, I have a, a wonderful family, wonderful friends. Dude, I'm blessed. And I, and so your, your second part of the question is when did I figure out that was going to be be the deal? I remember in 2000, um, I went to go get a tattoo, a really big tattoo on my arm. And I'm like, you know what? I'm probably never going to have to work a, a real job and have to worry about tattoos anymore. So that was that was the the uh, instigation of just like you know now I'm sleeved. I've got tattoos <laughs> over probably a good third of my body, if not more. And it was just from that idea that I, I I'm not going to have to work an office job ever again, or you know take a ditch. So you. Um, you you're saying 2000. So this was still after uh, some pretty decent success. You know, with, with singles like, you know, Father of Mind and everything. So this was still, yeah. uh, you know, uh, uh, I wouldn't say a decent w ways into your career, but, you know, still uh, early, but still after all your recent success as well. So that's that's pretty incredible that it, it, it hit you at that moment well, as well. Well, it, it had probably, in reality, been a reality before that. But I, like I said, I grew up poor. And my mom was born, you know, before and grew up in the Depression, so... I, I've always had that mentality of like, don't count your chickens before they hatch, man. <laughs> you know, um, live well, but not gratuitously stupid, you know, Absolutely. and always, always be prepared. So, um, I will, I, I was less is more, man. I don't, I don't, I don't live fancy, you know, the quality I, over quantity. Some other people do, but, but, and, and I don't take the, the most important thing is because of my sobriety, and even at that time, I've been sober um, 11 years. Um, I don't take things for granted. I'm grateful for what I got, and I don't take anything for granted. I think that's one of the most interesting things about you know your sober journey or your sobriety is you hear a lot of times people become a rock star and they're living that music lifestyle and that rock and roll lifestyle. You actually got sober before things took off for you. Yeah, it wouldn't have happened. I was too violent, too violent of an alcoholic, too violent of a drug addict. There's no way I would have had the success if I was using. I'd be dead. I, I'm not even. I don't even. I don't trip on that at all. I know exactly. I would be dead. The clear people can pull it off. Yeah, not me. 
<laughs> the clarity that comes with sobriety, you know, and especially with the time that you guys have hit off and really caught the popularity in the early and mid nineties. Yeah. That, that probably couldn't have happened if you're, if you're struggling <laughs> with addiction, right? Absolutely. It was one mid to late nineties, but late eighties, early nineties. So it's in other bands working up to it. We got signed in 94. We hit in 95, 96. So one mid to late nineties, but you're right. That clarity that comes with it. Um, it and it also, it has a lot to do even with my addictive personality, which is fierce, fierce. I mean, it just, I got holes in me that I just want to fill up with everything. And uh, by working a program, I'm not one of those guys that can just white knuckle it. That's what we call people who, you know, don't drink, but, you know, uh, don't go to meetings and don't work a program. Um and a lot of people are not alcoholics, they're problem drinkers, and they don't need the program. I am an old school blackout alcoholic. I'm going to, I'm not going to have a couple of wine spritzers, right? <laughs> That's not going to happen. If I had a beer two hours later, I'm looking for a speedball, dude. And that's not, there's no joke there. Don't trip on that at all. I'm looking for the real stuff. And, uh, I'm just grateful that I wasn't not still using or in that mindset with uh, fentanyl available mm-hmm. and all those drugs, all those cheap drugs that are just killing people left and right, just knocking them off. Even sober brothers of mine, man, have been in it. I know a guy who had 28 years of really good working sobriety, um, slipped up, had a drink. Uh, three days later, died from fentanyl. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And then kids, grandkids, sucks. Yeah. Um, just I mean, sucks. That's, that's just, uh, I, I think that's really inspirational. I think that's that's huge. Uh, it's definitely something to be proud of. Um, and, and, and that's awesome. But I'm, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Uh, just to, just how does it finally feel to have songs from an American movie, uh, Volume 1, released on vinyl after all these years? That's a really great question. Don't you bring it back home, brother. <laughs> As you probably know, this way, I like your little juxtaposition subway, just kind of nudge it. That's all good and all. That whole sobriety and saving your life thing is cool. But let's talk about something important like the yellow vinyl. No, I think I think that's I definitely think that's super important, and and it's awesome because. Uh, one, if you didn't do it, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't be here right now either. Mm-hmm. Sure. You know, just talking yeah. to you, and we wouldn't have the. Music. No, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Oh, I, I, just I know. You are, but, like, but I don't want that to get. I don't want that to get lost because that's that's huge. I think that's that's something. You know, it's amazing. It is. It is. I mean, you know, when uh, I signed the Capitol in '94, um, we were in the middle of the bidding war, and I basically sent an email attack. A no. A fax. That's how we did it. There's no email, no texting. I can send a fax out to everybody and from my manager <clears throat> office and said, look, I want this much money. I want this many firm records. I want this much church support. I want this much marketing spread. I want this much mechanicals. You know, that, that you know, when it hits a certain sales thing, it turns into this and blah, blah, blah. And that was very specific. And everyone's like, wow, you, you know, this kid knows his business. Okay, that's cool. And then I sent out another addendum that said, oh, yeah, by the way, I want total creative control on everything, everything. And I put everything really big, <laughs> everything to do with the brand Everclear or Art of Sarkis. And I produced my own records. And of the 28 labels that had made offers, two-thirds of them just, oof, God, just God. <laughs> left with like seven or eight labels and I picked capital and uh, basically dictated to them. So um, long story short, um, I, in the contract, I said, you got to put out vinyl. It's a vanity thing. I know because vinyl did not sell at the time, but you got to put out vinyl to my specifications, minimum 500 copies. And they agreed to it. So well, the noise reissue came out for vinyl. They did it. Um, Sparkle and Fade came out. They did green vinyl with a, a red vinyl single insert. Awesome. And after Glow came out, they did blue vinyl. That's what I wanted to do. And I'm like, cool, man. So when Sons from American Movie came out, and 
I'm like, okay, so I'm going to send the artwork for the album. And they're like, we're not going to do that. And you need to talk to the label president. And I call the label president. And I'm like, dude, you know, it's in the contract. He goes, no, we're not doing it. I go, it's in the contract. You have to do it. He goes, really? Sue me. I've got two and a half million dollars of your money in the in the in the in the pipeline. Sue me. <laughs> I go, you know, officially you're a dick. He goes, no, I know. That's my job. Sometimes being a dick is my job. I'm like, man. So fast forward to 2024. I we knew we were gonna celebrate the 25th anniversary of the making of uh, Songs from American Movie Volume One: Learning How to Smile. We, we got licensed from, uh, uh, from Capital and Intervention Records. Shane Intervention has done our last few. We did uh, Sparkling Fade and so much of the Afterglow and did a great job with them. And it's a great job with this. Yeah, I don't know if any of you guys are vinyl guys, but this sounds great. 140 gram yellow vinyl sounds great and it looks cool. How did you have the wherewithal to know that that control and that power over your creative, you know, art, really, uh, how did you know to that that was important? Because you hear so many times of people signing their first record deal, especially in the 90s, that they get taken yeah. advantage of by, by greedy people and greedy, you know, record labels or management or whatever it is. How were you that aware that that was, uh, that, that was something you needed? Well, I was older at the time. I was 32 when I got signed which is ancient back then in rock years. Looking back on it now, at 62, I was a baby, right? <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, at the time, I was older. Plus, I had grown up in L.A. With, in, in the music scene, and I'd seen a lot of bands make really bad mistakes and get screwed for it. And so, when it came time, my time, I had learned, right? I had learned what different things were because friends of mine who'd had contracts, I'm like, I'd read the contracts and I'd be asking questions. And even when I got signed with my lawyers, you know, they would send these huge contracts, short forms or 22 pages, long forms or 54 pages. It's all what they call boilerplate, right? Which is just repetitive language that basically tells what the, what the, the thing is doing in a long-winded term, and I would make them explain it to me, and they go, don't worry about that, it's just bubble, I go, no, it don't work like that, dude, I'm paying you by the hour, you tell me exactly what every word means, mm. talk to me like I'm stupid, because I am stupid, <laughs> I don't understand that, and I'm like, I'm paying you, man, don't give me any cuff, do your job, I'm doing my job, you do your job, and I'm still like that. I'm so, I'm so kind of hard ass. Do your job. I usually put the I, I usually put a word with the, that starts with the letter F in there. Do your fucking job. Yeah. How about that? Love it. No. But, yeah, man. But that's you know I was stupid in some ways. I trusted people. I trusted my managers who kind of screwed me over. I trusted that was back in the day. I've got great management now and great business management now. But I had you know. They, I I trusted people, and I uh, it's it's hard when you when you have success. Everybody's nice to you, but are they? <laughs> you know, uh, you know. I'm I'm a life coach now, and I coach uh, like people in the creative industries. I talk to guys in bands, people in bands, and I'm like I'm a hard ass man. Management doesn't want to hire me because I'm like. Do not sign a contract with management, ever. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. Do this, learn from my mistakes. Learn from my successes and learn from my mistakes. Don't do that. And, um, yeah, liberal people don't like that. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> now, uh, Art, with, with uh, having pretty much all your like creative control and uh, kind of in control of your own marketing as well. Like, did did that really kind of more influence how you wrote your music, especially when uh, Capital agreed to let you kind of have that control there? You know, and and also like with your sobriety, 
how does that influence your writing, you know, pre-sobriety, post-sobriety, and also with, you know, writing everything? Do you also write the bass, the, the drums? Like, how? <laughs> Oh yeah, I'll, I'll throw I'll throw thirty at you, but that's what I got right now. <laughs> well, I, 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 I can dig it. That's cool. So let's let's look at it this way. So, what are we doing on time? I got a few more minutes here. Um, so the first question is: Did that change the way I wrote songs? Not at all. I've always just written music. I refuse to write try to write singles because it doesn't work. It's like I, 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 the analogy I use is like people who try to be funny are not funny. Yeah. You're either funny or you're not. You meet people who are just naturally funny. Like I can, I'm funny in a different way. I can't, I can't tell jokes because I laugh at my own jokes. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's that's just not me to do that. I would never do that. People who have the balls to do stand up comedy, uh, I'd say one out of eight is is really funny. But the fact that they get up there and do it anyway, it's pretty bad at um, But coming back to music, I, I write songs. And I keep writing songs till um, I feel like there's songs that could work at radio, you know. And I didn't submit songs to people. That was in my contract deal as far as controlling. I didn't do demos. I didn't leave it up to them. It was like, my agreement was, I'm going to give you an album, you're going to put it out. But I'm not stupid or arrogant enough, even man, to think, and I was plenty arrogant, but I wasn't that arrogant, and to think that I could give them something and whatever it was was going to work. I knew there had to be songs. When I wrote Santa Monica and we played it with the band, we're like, mm-hmm, okay, there's something here. Same thing with... Uh, I'll buy you a new life, everything to everyone, father of mine. Um, another song on that record that was our first single that I thought could have been a hit single, but just didn't end up being, was a song called One Hit Wonder. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, so I wanted to give the label mm-hmm. everything they needed. And when I turned in the record, I'd ask them, I'd go, do you have what you need? And every time they're like, yeah, we got what we need, we can make this work. you're giving us the tools we need and now we're going to put our expertise and our money behind it and that's what a major label was money, right? Mm -hmm. it was like I felt like I already had a car tricked out but I didn't have an engine I had like a little you know, two stroke engine you know, and they put a big old V8 in there brought with rocket fuel and um, that's, that's what made it work Art, right, we know you got to get out of here. We know your time's limited. Got one more for you, really, really quickly. And I want, okay. I want can you, uh, can you stick with me because I'm going somewhere on this. Uh, I think, okay. I think about when the song "Pumped Up Kicks" was released and the excitement around it. And I remember even people tweeting out like, "That's the club banger," but the lyrical content was very serious for the the the, the dichotomy of how it sounded. It sounded very poppy. Uh, in in you know juxta, juxtapose. I'm trying to use big words here. Uh, <laughs> to me, is a five dollar word, and it's really really. I'm I'm, I'm I'm going to be bankrupt here in a minute. You're using, using expensive words. But I think um, I think that's one of the reasons that I'm such a huge Everclear fan. Is a song like Father of Mine sounds very poppy and it sounds happy but the lyrical content is very different from that was that a, was that a conscious effort is that something that you were intentional about or is that just how it came out just how it comes out um i would say i would say wonderful was a better example of that um you know na 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 yeah i got more than voice sir. but <laughs> you know and it's not a happy song <laughs> at all but yeah i mean I grew up in the 60s and 70s and the 80s, and I really love melody, and I love major note melody, and I, I get tired of, like, minor note and people who write, write really depressing sounding songs, but I like to write words and lyrics, storytelling, that matter. I don't think they're really depressing, totally depressing, but they're real. I think there's reality there, and sometimes that's not pretty. And but I like 
I had to write from the first person, so everyone thinks my songs are autobiographical. About a third of them are, Father Mine, yes. I'll Buy You a New Life, yes. Other ones as well. Another third are songs that I take things from my life, and I put a different character on them, and, like, wonderful. You know, I, I built a character around both me and watching my daughter and watching friends of mine go through divorce with kids, and I built it like that. And then there's songs I just write, you know, that I just write. And Santa Monica was one of them. Even though I was living in a place where I was living in the cold in up in uh, Oregon, where it rains all the time, and uh, I was missing my sunshine because I grew up in Santa Monica. So when I wrote that song and I, I didn't put the name Santa Monica on it. It freaked out of everyone at the label, and they tried to change it. And I'm like, nope, look at the contract. Nope. <laughs> Saturday. And, uh, it, it did okay. I think it did okay. Saturday, October 19th, Jefferson City, Missouri, CRMU Healthcare Amphitheater, Everclear with Marcy Playground and Jimmy's Chicken Shack. Art, thanks so much for joining us today, man. Thanks, fellas. I really enjoyed talking to you guys. You guys have a wonderful day. Thank you, you too. Awesome, man. Thank you. Thanks, brother. Take care.